So hi everyone, my name is David Faust. Uh, I've been working on the PPF support in GCC and in Binutils for a few years now. Um, there will be portions of this talk that are given by Cupertino and Jose, they'll join me, but I guess I'm getting started and I have the fancy headpiece thing, so. This is not the first time we've given a talk on BPF support. Um, you might have seen it's, it's been an ongoing project for years now. So this is sort of the 2024 update. A um, little bit of an outline here. But I think the big thing that's happened in the last year or so is that we've kind of finished the port to the point where it's ready for production use and is in fact being used, um, but in various distributions. And so the big, the big thing there is compiling all of the Linux kernel self-tests. And as people probably know, BPF is very much a Linux kernel technology. And so the self-tests that they've got there are very, very thorough and kind of push it to its limits in terms of exhaustive test cases, all of the bleeding edge stuff. So for a long time, we've been struggling to implement everything that was required, in fact, to even compile some of those tests. And now those are all in place. and most of them pass. The ones that are uh, not functioning as tests for now are still basically blocked by verifier issues where the code generated by GCC doesn't exactly match the code that's generated by Clang, and some of the patterns that are emitted, the BPF verifier in the kernel doesn't actually understand. So the code is correct, but the verifier in the kernel can't know that it's correct, and so the, it rejects the tests. Um, but with that point, now that it's a usable thing, people are starting to use it. So we've, it's been shipped in Oracle Linux for a while just because you know I'm from Oracle. And it's been picked up and shipped now in the GCC BPF crosses in Debian and in Gentoo and in Fedora. And people are starting to build things with it. So at least in Gentoo, they're starting to build the system D, the BPF portions of system D with GCC instead of with Clang. And so that's that's exciting, not only for us as the GCC people, but also from the perspective of people that don't want to have to carry around a Clang, a big LLVM install all the time. So moving into what's sort of actually happened, this is you know just keeping up with the latest developments in BPF. So in Binutil's side, that means supporting all of the newest instructions that they've got. So things like unconditional byte swapping. Previously, the only byte swapping instructions were Endian dependent, so you couldn't unconditionally swap bytes for things that you wanted to. Um, there's longer displacement jumps. That was something that they found they needed, rather unsurprisingly. There are signed memory loads and register moves. And um, finally, there is signed division and signed modulus, which is something that we told them they would need years ago. Uh, they said no, why? Yeah, they said no. Why, why, why would you ever need signed division? Uh, well, <laughs> turns out it's useful. So in addition to that, there's things you can do now with some of the newer jump instructions that we've got. So basically relaxation, being able to, if you have jumps that were too far before, now we can relax them. Um, we turned it on by default in the assembler, so it makes sense. Um, another big thing that happened in the assembler is sort of, there was an awkward difference in terms of how overflows were handled between the original LLVM implementation and what we did. So we've worked with them to sort of consolidate it in terms of, if you have any immediate field, any written number whose two's complement fits in that will be accepted, and then leave it up to the instruction to figure out what to do with that. And that resolves some of the disparities that there were between LLVM compiled stuff and GCC compiled stuff. And also, with the new relaxation from the previous slide, just realizing, hey, let's not try to relax immediates if we're leaving them up to the instruction, and we'll only do that if there's an expression. Um, Another useful thing has been the addition of the, taking some of the machine dependent bits and the elf header flags and saying, okay, let's encode the actual version of BPF that we're compiling here because over time they've added more and more instructions to the BPF instruction set. And so if you take something that's compiled with a newer compiler with say compiled to version four of the ISA and you try to load it on some kernel that only has version three implemented, then the kernel is gonna say, no, I, I don't know what to do with this. These aren't real instructions. And so the, the header flags just are a convenient way of encoding that, and then the disassembler honors them unless the user specifies them explicitly and stuff. So that's just uh, pretty useful. Um, the, the bulk of what's been going on, though, is in GCC, probably unsurprisingly. The first thing, people in this audience might not be familiar with this, but at LPC, I think this is exciting. Um, 
We had to ship for a while a, a workaround for the BPF headers, or for the BPF helpers. That's something that's shipped in the kernel, but for GCC for a long time, we had to have this workaround file, and it was a pain in the butt for everybody involved. So we've managed to implement everything we need to use the real kernel version and not our own, and that way it's not a headache anymore. Um, another thing that we were lacking on was the BPF core, which is compile once, run everywhere, is basically building your BPF programs on one kernel and then running them on a different kernel version. Um, and so that's finally been completed in GCC. Um, another, things, another couple of things are sort of changes in the defaults to match uh, what users actually expect. So for one, the BTF, which is the, uh, the BPF type format, sort of the type information for BPF programs, that's now the default when you're generating, when you say minus G for the BPF target, because that's sort of what people expect by default. And then if you want, you can also generate dwarf with just G dwarf. And <laughs> the assembly syntax, from the beginning we've had sort of two syntaxes because in LLVM they use this very pseudo C style thing on the left with the R0 equals. Um, turns out it's a pain in the butt for any program that expects something that looks like an assembly language and anybody who expects to read assembly language. So we sort of adopted the more typical assembly syntax from the user space BPF project. Um, the problem with that is that there's a lot of inline assembly in the kernel BPF headers and those are all written with the pseudo C syntax. So in practice, it becomes necessary to sort of do this by default so that we can compile things that are using those. Um, also, one sort of, one thing that comes up a lot with BPF is that you can't have any library calls. And so you can't fall back on things if your instruction patterns don't implement, the, you can't fall back to lib calls if your machine doesn't implement some instruction patterns. So one thing that we've done recently is to make sure that the, the built-in memmove and memcopy, that family of things is always expanded in line in a way that the verifier can understand. And that avoids issues with falling back to lib calls and then finding out that you don't have anything actually implementing that lib call, so you can't, you can't use the program. Um, another related uh, facet with the different versions of the instructions is that there's all these flags that are used, and there's feature macros that are used by existing BPF programs and people who have been using BPF for years now to check whether these different kinds of instructions are available. And so as we implemented them in GCC, we, we added the, the flags so you can have finer grain control than just a bulk, GC, a bulk CPU version. And that turns out to be useful because a lot of people are, having, are using custom forks where they've backported certain instructions from later versions, so they might support only CPU version three, but then they also have, say, the long, longer jump instructions. And so there's feature switches that let you turn them on and off, and now we're also emitting the same, uh, the same mac feature macros so that people can have the same checks between compiling with GCC and LLVM, whatever. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And to revolve the support list at all. <laughs> so, uh, well, well, you now have uh, only six, so you'll be, you'll be fine. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that. Uh, 
That, that is a, definitely a concern, especially because they just, they keep adding stuff to the BPF instruction set, so. What's your point, that they are not really instruction set designers? <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. And well, well, we say that you can do stuff in a uh, do instruction set, but then you have to go in the previous generation stuff as well, if you have that in your instruction. Yeah. And you do not have a random combination. Yeah, so usually, I mean, usually these flags aren't very useful. I mean, what people typically do is they will use whatever is the latest version in the kernel that they have, right? And, but in very rare cases, they will have an older version, and then they've backported some set of patches for the kernel to turn on one of the new instructions, but not all of them. And so that's, for now, it's manageable. It doesn't necessarily mean it will always be. So, yeah. Well, in this case, at least here, only six. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope it stays that way. Um, yeah, so the next thing that's been going on is completing the core implementation, and uh, I think Cupertino is gonna talk about that, so. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so, so last year I, I presented core, but it was more focused on the, on the how to implement it within GCC taking as example the initial implementation from Clang. Uh, this year I'll focus more on like show the end result after it's done and a little bit of a glimpse of how I did it. Okay, so what is core? Core, like David says, is compiled once run everywhere and um, basically the intent is to multiple kernels to be able to run the same binary produced for BPF. It relies on, on this type relocations in order to patch the code at load time such that it would uh, would fix the offsets to access the specific fields of structures or enumerations and uh, yeah uh, th that's basically that I have a diagram on the next slide that shows a little bit what I meant so for example I don't know if yeah works so we, we have two kernel versions in this, not kernel verse, two structures representing structures within the kernel, for example, right? And one might compile an application, a BPF application that's using this struct as a reference uh, that would be in the binary. So on, on the other side, you have another kernel version that has a different structure that was compiled and run parole and generated BTF information for that, for that version. So the core infrastructure actually generates the code uh, uh, in the, the best as possible, meaning that with fewer instructions as possible to represent a, a load or a store of something that you don't know yet where it is in the structure. So, for example, you have the load and the load would be associated with a relocation that would be patched at load time based on the BTF information to to, to, to fix up the offset that would be within the load uh, to be the right patch for the new kernel version. The loader itself verifies that both BTFs are compatible and if in case they, some, some field doesn't exist or the stop existing in the new kernel version, it would abort with an error. So the, the BPF, BPF uh, core infrastructure actually is implementing using built-ins. So as you can see this, for example, the first built-in has two operands. One is the field access, which would be, I'll show in an example after. But, but then they kind of collapse like what would be multiple built-ins in, in single built-ins. And then the second operand would be what the built-in would actually be doing. For example, uh, let's take a smaller example. This enum value, you would have the enum type and the enum uh, the name, and then you would specify if you want to know if the, it exists or what is the enum value in this specific kernel version where this BPF application is running. So, um, so as you can imagine, it, this could be quite tricky to get, and indeed we needed to hack, uh, hack a little bit the front end in order to obtain this information. Uh, 
to sum up, so all these four, four built-ins are actually more of like collecting BTF information. None of them uh, is, has any effects within the code itself. However, the, 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 this, this part down below actually is the one that allows to access data, either loading or storing. And uh, it's uh, based on this built-in preserve access index. And this would actually, so if you have such an access, it, it would generate the code that would uh, be setting the relocation such that it would correct the offsets on the loads and the stores in order to obtain the data uh, from, from the load. So in the, in the next slide, I have an example. And this is the most simplistic example of this preserve access index, right? And uh, as you can see, you have the, the, a store of 42 to this uh, P dash B. And because you actually attributed the, the struct, then this would kind of like annotate this PB with the built-in preserve access index, although it's not the same thing. Uh, that's not what's happening, that's what I mean. And so what, just to say that both of these lines would be kind of the same thing and produce the same result, except that one is loading and the other is storing. And so the assembly result of this actually is a store and a load. And the, the thing to notice is that the relocation itself is not a regular relocation that is... Do you want to... I'm, uh, I'm just wondering if, if the attribute on the structure is enough to uh, decorate the store, why isn't it enough to decorate the load as well? Why do you need to explicit, explicitly call built-in preserve access index on the return? Why can't you just say return P into B? Yeah, it would have worked. It's just an example. And uh, just to show that there are two ways of actually doing it, nothing else. So they are... They are semantically the same thing, because this thing is attributed. Imagine this was not attributed, this would not be generated as a, 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 a core access. So, like I was saying, the, the thing to, to note is the core relocation. And this core relocation is actually not a traditional relocation, it's set in a, a specific section for BTF extensions that are specific to BPF applications. No other target has this support. Has, generates this section. And uh, then from this section, you actually access or, or contain references to BTF information that would allow you to understand what the type actually is. So just to give a glimpse of the internal part on, on how we are actually doing the, the, the transformation and collecting this data. So, um, so we now actually go through, we have a specific pass this thing is, a, is an error. This was intended to be 009 BPF core lower, okay? And, uh, uh, and, and what happens is that on that pass, I actually traversed the Gimple tree, looking for things that are attributed with preserve access index. And then I identify if I can compute at compile time the offset. And if I can, and this thing is an, a preserved access index, then I know that I can convert this thing into a pointer plus offset access. And so I construct these, 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 uh, these entries in, in the GIMPL with this built-in core HELOC. And one in this particular case is actually an index within a table which I copy both the type information associated with that and the expression itself. And I kept it all through compilation until I'm on, on the last stage, to just to keep, to be able to actually generate the relocation referring to the original type and the original expression that was associated with it. Uh, I do this thing because otherwise the other passes in GCC can play with it and then I'll lose the information. Okay. So in the next example is a little bit, a little bit more complex, but is a little bit more of the same and just with the with different types of expressions down here. You can, just for conclusion, this, you, have, you have the structures. But then you see that this thing, this, except from the first one, that is actually as a, a you can compute the offset of x from P, from, from P, and then all, always 
you, you also know the size of QS at, at compile time, you know the index. So you can assume that you can actually get the full access in one, row, one instruction. So that's what you get. You have a store in which you have a single offset 42, which would be the offset of, for all these expression. Uh, no, sorry, 48, 42 is the equal sign. So 48 is the offset. And this 48 is what is patched by this relocation here, okay? And this information is what I kept on that original built-in. So the same goes with these two expressions, except that you have two indirections. And so for that reason, reason you cannot compute the immediate offset because you have another pointer. So you compute the offset for this one and, and these, this part, and they are both expressed in two instructions, okay? So it's, and that's it. And th this is more of the same, but with uh, array indexes. So very minimalistic. So the other thing, and this is an example that actually doesn't work in, in, in Clang or LLVM, and, and which is, is when you have like an unknown index in an array access, right? In the particular case, and, the reason, and because we now we are not so centric on the built-in transformations, but rather in um, uh, walking the, the gimbal tree and identifying what are the expressions that we need to convert, then we, we figured out that it would be relatively easy to support this kind of uh, uh, presentation. So for, for this example, and it, this is not in upstream code, uh, but but you can see that I can generate a relocation which collects the size of the struct Q, which would be for this particular structure eight, but for the running kernel it will be something else. And then we can actually create a core relocation to collect the size of the struct, and then having the arithmetics to actually compute the the position in the next pointer to actually get the access. And uh, that's exactly what's happening here. The th the, the thing to notice is that in this particular example, we actually are lucky to be, have a gimbal format of this type. We don't have what comes next in the next one, which is sort of the same, but instead of using QP and QP being, uh, oh, sorry, in the previous one, <laughs> I was missing there. So QP being a pointer to the circ Q, right? Uh, so. It, instead of using QS, which would be, we have QP, which is a pointer. And for that reason, the, 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 the parser or the front end actually doesn't generate this array ref, but instead generates pointer arithmetics, which then will be harder to, un to unveil and discover that the particular aid that is here is not the size of the struct. So it would be, extremely interesting to actually be able to annotate these eight in the gimbal format in order to say, okay, you know, this is an eight, but it actually comes from the size of the struct. And in that particular case, we could also support this kind of, uh, of code. Yeah, but this is exactly what you're doing, right? Uh, in, the, in the example before, you annotate the eight, the size of Q. Well, yeah, right, I know. So, so you do that in the example before and you are not doing it here, so I don't see the principal difficulty. I, I, I did not understand the case. Oh, sorry. So, yes. so, so this is the default problem, right? Yeah. So one example identifies the size of the struct. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be the size of the the in the in the in the gimbal and this is really on the in the gimplification step right so in the gimbal we actually have an expression like this which is this would be an array ref on the next one you don't on the next one you have the pointer arithmetics it was expanded so I'm maybe I'm of of course of course you have to you, you need to change the expander that that actually calculates the expression and substitutes the eight in this multiplication by extra instruction, which you can annotate. Of course, of course. I, I just wanted to see, say that there are no principal difficulties in that. It's, it's just you need to change the expression expander. Nothing, nothing special, I guess, yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's nothing special, it's just that we didn't do it yet because it's not, a, not actually a pattern that Clang supports. So our target is really to support whatever they have and then just showing it as a next step. So I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm just finishing. So just to finish, like, uh, 
we stop having a, a, a kind of built-in centric idea of how to implement this thing and it goes to a simple traversal format. We use this get inner reference as, as the, the way to figure out, uh, to, to extract the information of what is computable at compile time and what is not in order to do a recursive transformation. And uh, uh, yeah, so we are running self-test. We did run the self-test. We actually found many bugs with it in, in core. And uh, yeah, uh, upstream we are just compiling PPF or, or the self-test, but uh, in the house we are actually running. Uh, so we we'll look forward to, to, for it to be running upstream. Thanks. Uh, okay, so the next thing, there's this, there's BTF, which obviously the core stuff relies on, but also in general is pretty centric to BPF. Um, so I just want to clear up in case anyone's unfamiliar, just quickly, BTF is the BPF type format. Um, it's not exactly a debug format in that it's meant to represent just type information so that the programs can be loaded by the kernel. Uh, so it's, it's different from Dwarf. You can kind of think of it, it does have shared ancestry with CTF. Um, so it's sort of a, a ugly domain-specific cousin of CTF. Um, and as, as Cooper showed with the, with the core relocations, you need also BTF for the kernel itself. So you've got sort of, there's really, um, even though it's domain specific in terms of you generally need BTF for BPF programs to be able to load the program, in order to load the program correctly, you also need BTF for the kernel that you're loading it on. And so in GCC, you can generate this for any target. Uh, it's the default for the BPF backend, but if you wanted to generate it for other targets as well, you could just pass GBTF. Uh, the only constraint here is that it's, we're only dealing with C. So if you are running the compiler and, it's, and you're running it as a C++ compiler, uh, don't do GBTF because you either get something incorrect or I think it'll just say, it might ice or say sorry. It just says no. Oh, it just says no. Good. That's what it just should do. It should just say no. Um, so in terms of what BTF actually looks like, it looks like this. It's a lot like CTF in terms of you've got some source on the left and you've got um, the BTF for it. You've got different, you know, you've got your integers, you've got structs, you've got pointers. Um, there's forward, forwards for the forward declaration of A there and functions, function prototypes, and they just say, you know, here's, here's the function, here's the return type, here's the argument types, and then they refer to each other. It starts all over. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the big thing, most recently, I guess, um, I refactored a lot of the BTF implementation in GCC just because it was getting, um, BTF has grown a lot over time, similar to BPF. And so it kind of became a, a lot of a pile of hacks of adding things into the implementation that weren't there in the first place. And it got very ugly, so I, I rewrote a lot of it to make it less complicated and easier for myself to maintain and to extend as they keep adding things to BTF. And there were a couple of nice bug fixes in the process. So there was an issue where BTF has these um, data sec records, which are sort of like they record um, four different sections, what variables are in those sections and how big they are so that it can pass that information to the kernel BPF loader or whatever other BPF loader to correctly allocate space for the variables in each section. Um, and in the old implementation, there was actually a bug where if you had things that were variables that were completely optimized away, so you have some variable that you declare in the program and it gets, I don't know, constant folded or whatever, and it doesn't exist at all in the resulting object, the intent of BTF is to represent what's in the resulting object, not what was there at source level. And so we had erroneous data sec entries for variables that were at the source level but had been totally optimized away, and then there were still entries in the BTF claiming, hey, you've got this variable X in BSS that you need to allocate space for, but actually X has been completely removed and constant folded. Um, another thing here is that there's just a, there's a better cut between what's going on in the early passes and what's going on in the late passes. And that's something that we're gonna be dealing with in the future because right now we, you can't generate BTF with LTO or you'll get, uh, you'll have problems. So that's great, make it less complicated, make it easier to maintain, make it easier to extend. And then we can immediately throw that all out the window by complicating things again. Um, so this is gprune BTF, which is an option that was added earlier this year. 
Um, and the motivation for it is basically, this is an example of a self-test from the kernel. And this compiled, you know, compiling with GCC, compiling with Clang, generating the BTF, and then comparing them. And so GCC on the left, you can see for this one self-test, and this is an extreme example, I'll admit, but it was generating 8,007, more than 8,700 types in the BTF. And so the BTF section was absolutely huge. And the kernel people are saying, you know, what's going on? Why are you wasting all this space? Whereas Clang is only generating 56 types for the same program. And the reason, really, is these includes. And so as a general thing, if you're a BPF program that you're loading into the kernel, the BPF program is going to interact with some kernel data structures. So you need definitions of those kernel data structures. But typically, your BPF program is only interacting with one or two structures at most, and maybe it has to read a field and write one other field. But by pulling in these headers, you end up including thousands of types. And because internally in GCC, we have the sort of the internal dwarf die tree as the canonical debug representation, all of that was being translated into BTF. And so you end up getting all of the types from all of the headers that you've included for your BPF program, even though you need to access just one structure. And so it became pretty common that with just the kernel self-tests, we're getting you know, a magnitude of 10, uh, or an order of 10 size increase in compiling with GCC versus compiling with Clang. And digging into that a little bit, I began to realize that really we have two modes of BTF generation. On one hand, there's generating BTF for a BPF program, which is you want as little as you possibly can have for that program to be loaded correctly by the kernel. But on the other hand, you need all of the BTF information for the kernel. And so you've got these two different modes where on one hand you want minimal BTF so that you can have a small portable thing that loads quickly and is verified quickly. And on the other hand, you need everything. And since we are supporting BTF not just for BPF programs, but for anything, the hope is that eventually, when you go to generate the BTF for the kernel, you can just do that directly with the compiler. Right now, you can't do that because the linker doesn't understand what to do with BTF. But currently, what they're doing is you need BTF for the kernel, you generate dwarf for the whole kernel, and then you translate it into BTF using PA hole or some other tool. Um, that's kind of an annoying process for everybody involved, and it takes some time. So enter this new option, gprune BTF. Basic idea is just to try to do, try to find out what that minimal set of type information that you actually need is, and then only generate that. And the, the catch here is that Clang does this unconditionally. And so we need to be, ideally we would be compatible with what they're doing so that people aren't getting unexpected differences in the type information. So a special thanks to uh, Yang Hong Song who developed this on the LLVM side to help you know, make sure we were compatible and doing the same thing in terms of this pruning. And it turns out that they really wanted this to be on by default, uh, so we did it for them. You can turn it off if you want. But what it, in terms of what it actually looks like, it looks something like this. So if you've got, you've got some struct that you're pulling in from a header, and then the BPF program, the only thing it ever does is it reads, reads through a pointer, it reads that, uh, C, that my pointer, arrow x, right? And so, Inside of struct C, you've got a pointer to struct B, and B could be some massive common data structure in the kernel. But if in this program you never actually use anything in struct B, you are, you're only pulling in the type because it's part of some other type that you want to use, well, you can, instead of generating all of the BTF information for structs for B fully, we just replace it with a forward that says, You've got the struct C that you're using, you have a pointer to struct B, but you don't actually care about the contents of struct B. And so it, this is basically the, the idea with the pruning is to say, starting from what you actually use, what do you need? And anything else that you can get rid of, you get rid of. And so that, that resolves the, the big size difference. Um, Got to quickly check the time here, okay. Yeah, well. <laughs> Well, I'll need it. Uh, so the other big thing that is missing in BTF at the moment is type tags and declaration tags. And these are fairly kernel specific. Um, 
The issue here is that there's a lot of semantic, associ semantic information associated with types that isn't actually encoded in the type system in terms of things in the kernel. And so the reason that you want this is so that you can pass that information to the verifier. So if you've got some pointer that comes from user space and you've got a BPF program that is interacting with a data structure or a something that has a pointer like that in it, you need to check in the verifier that the BPF program is not doing inappropriate things with that pointer. Yeah. Uh, I can move to you. Oh, yeah. Uh, so just a few comments about the verifier. Yeah. It, it, there's no specification for it, right? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's implementation defined. Okay, so two questions. One, I was wondering, I, Cupertino may be better for this. How big is a typical core program? Because all these, you know, are they ever generated programs or what? Because verifying the relocations. Yeah, typic so typically BPF programs are quite small. You're, you're, you load them for like some specific hook that you care about, okay. right? Okay, okay. And the second one is, how much does the verifier do with BTF anyway? Or is it unspecified and it may do more at some point? Because you yeah. sort of answered it. It's you... pretty much, they, it's unspecified and they may do more of, at some point. So one of the recent things that came up actually is they want the ability to say that a pointer type may be nullable. Like the value of this pointer at the en at entry to the function may be null or it can never be null. And that was something that they wanted to have that information in the verifier to correctly analyze the BPF program. Brilliant, thanks. But there wasn't any way of representing that until, until type tags. Uh, so, the, so the mechanism that they've devised for this is to basically have this way of associating arbitrary user strings with types or with declarations in the program. And then those strings are recorded in the debug information for use by post-compilation analysis tools, most particularly the kernel verifier. Um, the thing is, though, that this isn't just BTF specific. You also need it in Dwarf because you need... To get the BTF for the kernel, you need to go through Dwarf. And that means you need to represent all of this in Dwarf. So how do you do it? Well, there's a clear ideal way, which is that you treat a, a type tag, a type annotation, whatever that may be, the arbitrary user-specific thing, well, it, you just treat it like a const or a volatile, right? And that's, that's the natural way of representing it in terms of this, these Dwarf guys, for example, that you just treat it like it's a const or a volatile. And the problem is, of course, that any implementation, anything that's doing anything with Dwarf, if they don't know what this annotation die is, then it breaks, because you, you can't follow this type chain. Um, so what is happening today is this format where they've got the annotation dies emitted as the child of a declaration, or as a, as a, for, for deco tags, it's just the child of a declaration, and that's simple enough. But for type tags, what they've done is said, hey, we only care about this right now for pointers, so let's make it the child of a pointer with the semantics that it applies to the point E. And that doesn't break dwarf, but then there are cases where you have some type that's not pointed to by anything and you have no way of representing that. So we discussed this and we brought it up and we said, hey, what if we kept a similar thing, but instead of the semantics that it applies to the point D, we'll say, just make it a child of whatever type it applies to. And that's great, because now you can represent the annotations on any type. So you've got some simple pointer to an int, and you've got a tag which applies, to, in this case, to the pointer itself. But you could just as easily move the tag and apply it to the integer just, base. Just yeah. to get this clear, the annotation here is acting like a sort of paint that applies to the pointer. And so, so, and so anything which, which points to that pointer is assumed to have that annotation where normally you would assume that be, you would expect to represent this by putting the annotation in between the variable and the pointer. You've done it by sort of attaching the annotation to the pointer and painting the, the pointer with that annotation. Yeah, to not break, yeah, to not break Oh, more. yes, but this is, this is certainly make it interesting to parse the resulting BTF. Mm. Yeah, because ideally, ideally you would have something like this where it's just like a const, right? But that breaks dwarf. So this is an improvement because we can now, you know, we can represent these annotations on any type, but then what happens if we do something like this, where we've got, we've got two integers, they have similar tags, but now because we've attached them as children of the type, if you have the same type with different kinds of annotations, well, you have to duplicate it, and then you have to share, you know, you have to duplicate the base type and then have a bunch of different annotations, a lot of which are exactly the same information. So in this case, we've got the BTF type tag, tag one, in two different places, and there's it's not shared, and 
So it, it, it breaks, you know, it, it doesn't break dwarf, but it's not great, it's wasteful. And so this is sort of the agreed upon thing that we're going for next, um, but it's not actually been, there's a patch series for it in LLVM, I have a patch series in it for GCC, which when I sent, there was the very clear comp, you know, complaint that, hey, this is wasteful, maybe we can do better. Um, since it's not into the mainline LLVM and not into GCC yet, well, there's time to improve. And so recently, um, this is including some of the feedback that we got on the original version of the patch series, um, this might actually end up being basically the same proposal that was come up by someone at Cauldron last year. I couldn't attend, but I heard from Cupertino. Um, but the basic idea is, what if we add, in addition to a new dwarf tag, we also add a new attribute? And that attribute just holds a, a reference to a die, if there is any, and then we can chain them together by using the, the, the attribute for the annotation that points to the dies that hold the actual information. And then if you've got a whole bunch of things that are shared, well, we can, we can share them. So the basic thing is look, it looks something like this, where rather than being a child of the pointer type here, you've added this AT annotation that points to the die, and that die holds the information. And consumers which don't know about the annotation can safely skip it because there's a, there's a whole set of rules for extensions to the dwarf attributes that as long as you obey these things, then it can, you know, you're, you're safe. In this case, because it's just a die reference, consumers can safely skip it if they don't know what it means. And now, going back to some of the waste, right, we can actually reuse these things where we've got, rather than having the, the base types that each, that both independently have the same tag one annotation, we just have one tag one annotation, and then we have a tag two where it's needed, and then we chain them together. And so for, for the X declaration, it's, it's, a base, it's an int, and then it has a, an annotation of tag two, and then it has an annotation of tag one. And for Y, it's just got the annotation of tag one. And so that's great because now we're sharing and reusing, and it turns out that a lot of the time you've got a whole bunch of different types in your program that all have exactly the same set of annotations. And so with this format, you only need those annotation dies once, and then you can share them. Yeah, Nick. There is another problem with the, with the previous implementation, which is if you've got two translation units, one of which has, a, yeah. uh, has both of the same type, and in one of them it's annotated, it, it's annotated, it's tagged, and in the other one it isn't, you can't deduplicate those together because, uh, uh, because, the type, because the types have the same name but different annotations. And you can't, uh, uh, um, with this representation, you can just have the annotation hanging off it, and some, of the, some variables use the annotated version, some use the unannotated yeah. one. With the previous implementation, that's impossible. You have to conflict them all. Uh, space wastage and generally a nightmare. Is there a question up in the back or is that just pointing? Okay. No. Oh, there is. Okay. Thanks. Uh, what would happen if you had a third line that would say int underscore underscore tag two? In that case, it, yeah. Yeah. So in that case, there are some cases where it's unavoidable to have duplication. So if, if we had a third declaration here that was an int Z, say, that was only tag two, then you would need a separate tag two that doesn't have an, an annotation chain. But there's some, at, at some point, there's a level where you can't really avoid some amount of deduplication. And so this, this, this works with ints, which is great, but of course it works with any other type also. So this is the same thing, but instead of another int, you've got some struct pointer, and it could have a whole set of other annotations or other types before it. It could be, you know, a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to a struct. But right at the end of the day, you're just using these same two annotation dies. And so you can have, you know, n different types that sharing the same annotation chain or the subchain. Um, now, another interesting aspect of this is that the ordering is actually preserved. So in this case, we've got the ordering of the two tags, tag one and tag two here, is actually important. Because if, if you switch the ordering, then you would have, a different, you would have the, the chain of annotation dies be the other way around. So that's something that it's not clear whether that's useful or not. Um, if you decided that you didn't care about ordering, then we could do, additional, do some additional deduplication because you wouldn't need a chain of dies that is, you know, tag two points to tag one and tag one points to tag two. You could just say they're the same. Um, but that's something that it's, it's not clear yet whether we want that or not. So 
that's sort of where I'm at. I wanted to finish a proper you know, proposal of this. Um, the problem right now is that the implementation with the, with the child dies. That's been, that's been implemented in LLVM, but in GCC there's been pushback saying, you know, the, the dwarf format is bad, let's change it. And so this is sort of an alternative approach that I think fit, addresses those concerns and hopefully, you know, if, if this makes sense to people, then we can go ahead and do this and then bring it to LPC, bring it to the LLVM people and say, hey, here's a better dwarf format let's move forward with this. So that, that's, that's what I'm hoping to do if I don't, you know, change get it. Again. Yeah, change it again. And they'll be mad because they'll have to change it again, but. It's like, it's like CV equals, well. Yeah, it's like CV equals in a way. And I've already written the, the dwarf part of this. I have a patch that implements it. I haven't done the translation step to BTF yet, but just from writing the dwarf portion of this, it's very natural in terms of, the, the code to actually get this done. And to me, it just kind of, it, it smells more right than the previous approach in terms of the approach, the previous approach is ugly to implement. So that's usually a good sign that it's a bad idea. So something that probably is uh, this ordering preservation thing, which with qualifiers, it doesn't happen, right? It's more like a set that, uh, right. Um, I think that if we decide that we want to have it as a set, I think we should make GCC to actually swap, you know, even randomly, to make sure that nobody relies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can take a, we can take a page serious, out serious yeah. proposal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. To avoid that. I think. Yeah. From, from what I've seen, I think there is some interest in keeping the ordering preservation for some of the kernel attributes that they want to use, but we'll see. I think it's, I think it's kind of neat that it preserves the ordering, but it's not something you should necessarily rely on because at the source level, these are just two attributes that apply to the same type and you're not guaranteed which one comes you know, first, logically. They just apply to the same thing. Um, so that's sort of it for the tags. That's where we are at the moment. Hopefully, patch series for this coming, and then we can move forward and say, hey, this is a better format. Let's implement this also in LLVM, and then we have an agreement, and we're, we're good to go. So, oh, isn't there supposed to be? Oh, whatever. Um, so, turning the page a little bit, that's kind of everything that's been done until now. That's where we are today. And I don't know why my section transition slide didn't appear, but up at the top, you can see this is moving over to open items and future work. Um, so the next thing that we'd like to do really is to have proper BTF support and bin utils like we have for CTF. Um, and that's something that likely we will need to do anyway if we, you know, if we want to support LTO and BTF, which we do, then we're gonna need to have a linker that understands what to do with BTF. And because of the relation between BTF and CTF and the, the commonalities between them, well, a great idea is, hey, let's just use the libctf support that we've got that already knows what to do with CTF, and BTF is very similar. Um, so let's go ahead with that, which I think Nick is going to talk about. Is it tomorrow? Yeah, so see Nick Alcox talk tomorrow, and there'll be more information, I think. Yeah, the, the dumping is also something that will fall out. Yeah, the dumping, as, as Nick just mentioned, the dumping is also something that will fall out of that. And the um, BTF dump for as well, sorry. <laughs> I'll add the BTF dump format as well, uh, because at the moment it's got a quite different dumping format for CTF and arranged to be able to use either with either of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, just gonna quickly go through the last couple of things, because I think Jose's got a little bit to talk about and I wanna leave some time for questions, but um, there's also the issue of that in general for BPF, we're compiling for something that is, is, we're compiling for this verifier, we're not really compiling for an architecture and so, the, the problem is that we can emit code, we'll generate code that is valid and does the right thing and the verifier doesn't understand it and then it rejects it and it rejects valid programs. And it becomes a big annoyance because the code generation depends on what happens in a lot of the middle end passes and at any time there could be some new optimization or even just a bug fix that causes GCC to emit a different set of instructions and now it's one that the verifier doesn't understand and what used to work gets rejected. Uh, Sam, yeah. Uh, how, how modular is the verifier implementation? I mean, should we? <laughs> yeah, modular. I know, I know, right? <laughs> it's one function. It's one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> because it would be interesting if we could have an optional, yeah. optional checking class where we run the verifier. Right, so ideally we have some formal set of, these are the things that the verifier verifies. Yeah. You know, these are the rules that it checks. Yeah. And then we can sort of have some sort of pass in the compiler that does that, but that, that is kind of, that's a huge can of worms. And that's the other thing I was gonna ask. They're never gonna do that, and they're never gonna stop improving the verifier, or you know, improving. Um, but so, there's been prior talks on this. You can see, I think, uh, Jose talked last year about the challenge of compiling for verified targets. We haven't really, you know, made much headway in that realm, but it's sort of a future problem. And uh, there's some other things on the horizon. I, Jose, do you wanna talk about this? Or? <laughs> Uh, well, just very quickly. Um, so BPF has a memory model. I don't know, is Paul here? No, he's coming for the kernel buff. But this, right. So BPF has a memory model. So basically, you have um, you have a C compiler like GCC compiles your C. It compiles it into BPF bytecodes, which can be seen as a, like an abstract architecture. And what is new now is that this abstract architecture, it has a memory model, which is basically uh, sort of, is based on the kernel memory model. You know that the Knino's kernel, they don't use the C memory model as such, but they changed it, and they are using their own memory model, LKMM, I think it's called. So. Since this year we got a memory model in the BPF architecture, then we had to adapt the compiler in order to actually do the right thing with it. And part of that was um, uh, basically to generate something sensible from the different built-ins, atomic built-ins, like fetch and add, add and fetch, you know, like uh, or and and so on. So um, we got it wrong initially, but in NLVM they got it wrong too, so okay, that's fine. Um, so basically this is what is now in the slide, is the latest uh, version of it, that it's been right now being discussed in a pull request in Clang, for the, the BPF LLVM hackers are working on that, and we have a patch for this that we will put in GCC as soon as the other part uh, gets, gets applied. Um, and then there is a little addend there, which is that now we need in BTF, BTF support different qualifiers for the types, like const, volatile, and so on. And now we will need a way like Dorf has, like this atomic qualifier for types, we need to add them to BTF, and we will coordinate with the BTF, BPF people, with the kernel people in Plumbers. No, no, I was ah. showing Ah, oh, okay, so that's it. Okay, yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty much it for slides, so there's some time for questions if people have them. I think there's, yeah, there's, you know. Ah, okay. <laughs> It's blank for a reason. Okay, this will be very fast because uh, so there are more time for questions. Okay, so the maintenance model. Okay, first I got some notes here. The pseudo C assembly syntax. It's a horror. It's a huge mistake, uh, but it's there. So, but we will uh, still fight. We will continue the fight. So BPF can still have, you know, maybe in the future some sane assembly syntax for doing assembly things. Right in assembly ways. Uh, okay. Um, also, the 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 ISA evolution on BPF and everything. Um, those are not like so to say like like uh, Porphyrian categories. I mean, they have not been like that forever. Like the I'm mentioning because Seger, you know, the, he made those those comments. I mean, uh, those different instruction categories and everything. They have originated like organically through time. So it's not something, it's not a design from scratch of an instruction set. So on that, on that way, you know, it has to be understood. For example, core. Now we have core, but there was a BPF pre-core era. And in that era, the BPF programs will include kernel internal headers, but not compiled to BPF, but compiled to those headers where the headers for x86 or for MIPS or for ARM or whatever. So you can imagine, what world that was, right? So now it's much better with core, even if core is ugly, whatever. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so the maintenance model. Now we have a little problem. Uh, and right now, uh, in practice, the people who are using Clang and LVM to build BPF programs, particularly the people who are having, who has like big BPF programs on the wild and working ones, 
at the end of the day, they feel they are forced, they get forced to fork some particular version of Clang uh, that happens to emit verifiable code for their particular BPF programs. Which, so this is a problem. This is a big problem uh, that of BPF in general and of the Clang, the Clang BPF support in particular. So we are trying to think slowly and, you know, on the GCC side, how to do it better, how to make it better. And also, you know, if we manage to do it better in Clang, they can start doing it better too. So part of that is the maintenance. So for example, now Faust mentioned that many distributions are actually packaging GCC BPF and Binutils BPF. Um, as far as I know, Debian, for example, Docker will correct me if I'm wrong, but the Debian GCC BPF package is pulling from GCC mainline, right? 14. For, for 14, but you also have some patches, right? It's not GCC 15. Are you sure? No? Ah, okay. Okay, well. Um, in Gento, uh, it's also 14 or 15. It's 14. Okay. Okay, so as people start using the compiler, we can expect, I guess, that we are, they are gonna hit the same kind of problems that they are hitting with Clang in that sense. So we will be talking with uh, the other GCC maintainers about this, but we are wondering what maintenance model could actually work best for BPF in particular. Like if it's always pulling for master and keeping branches or I don't know. But I mean, this is something that we can discuss. Like, okay. But yeah, otherwise that's it. Thanks. Last two minutes. Yeah. Oh, there's the at the back. Uh, up in the back, yeah. Uh, you had a slide that we're talking about Gno BTF for the duplication and two points. You were BPF programs, we can get rid of the duplication. Oh yeah, that's the one. And then point number two, you say Pahol like. So yeah. correct without the GCC support, uh, if you wanted to add the BPT, BTF section to kernel, when you were building the image, there was a phase that Pahol was running, processing some dwarf information and transferring it back. So with this support of number two, there is no need for Pahol anymore? There still is need. So first, there's the aspect of linking where the kernel is built out of many objects and they're linked together. And right now, the linker doesn't understand. But even supposing that we get that completed, there's pa Piehol or Pahol, I still don't know, is doing a little bit more in terms of there are some things that it adds into the BTF section for the kernel specifically that it knows about that in the compiler we can't do correctly. And so even, and I think the PA whole people would be happy to do this because it also has a BTF reader. So in that future where we just generate BTF for the kernel directly, then Peho will still have a place in terms of we output BTF and then it modifies some and adds whatever is needed. And so it, it reads in the compiler emitted BTF, appends a little bit or adds it or whatever it does and outputs BTF star, you know, modified BTF. The linker BTF. Yeah, the linker, it, yeah. So, otherwise I think we're out of time. Yeah, thanks. thanks.